Anyway, welcome to today's New Mexico Smart Grid Center webinar. It features um, a large group from Siemens uh, that will be discussing some of their new software solutions for distributed energy optimization. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with the webinar series, you can always go to our New Mexico EPSCoR website and sign up for our newsletter and also just pay attention to the website. We have uh, frequent changes there and updates and we have uh, an extensive webinar series planned uh, over the course of the summer and also we'll be carrying it through the fall as well. Uh, the second webinar in the coming up is on the next slide and this will be led by Frank Curry from Santa Fe Community College and he'll be discussing the Smart Grid Workforce Development Program at Santa Fe Community College. And this is on July 22nd. <clears throat> and on the next slide, uh, just to explain how this works, at the lower portion of your screen, you should be able to move your cursor and you will see things like participants, chat, share screen, da da da. And on the far right of that is something called Q&A. And this is where we'll take uh, questions at the very end of the seminar. Um, so you can type in your questions there. And then uh, Brittany, who at least I see on my screen as well in a little picture there, will be serving as the moderator uh, after the seminar concludes. And we'll take, again, Q&A at that point. And the next slide. Basically, I just want to introduce uh, Bill Kipnis at this point. He is the senior project developer for Siemens New Mexico, uh, and he works in the Smart Infrastructure Division. He is, importantly, on our EPSCoR State Committee and serves as a, a major advisor to the EPSCoR Smart Grid Project. His expertise is in renewable energy, microgrids, building automation, mechanical system efficiency and water conservation. And he has degrees from the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business and Colorado College. So at this point, I'm going to transfer over control of the screen and Bill, you can continue introducing your colleagues. Thank you. Brittany, is there any way that you can unmute Bill? Um, oh. I've, yep, there we go. It, Go ahead, um, Bill. You're on. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, well, this is a presentation on Siemens DEOP, which is distributed energy optimization, uh, which we developed as microgrids have emerged on t onto the grid and smart grids become better defined. Um, we saw the need for software uh, for advanced monitoring of multiple microgrids and data acquisition. But I'm going to leave the details of that to, to Marcella and Magdalena, who are joining us from Italy. Um, but first, some intros to, to our team will be available for questions um, after the presentation. Um, Marcello's work includes specifications for monitoring and optimization of energy flows within smart grids and microgrids, and developing algorithms to optimize electricity exchanged within a microgrid, uh, composed by molten salt storage, for example, including large-scale solar PV. He's he educated at the Polytechnic Institute in Milan. Um, Paul Benison, uh, which we welcome to the call today, um, who's business development manager for microgrids. Um, his key solution expertise includes economic dispatch, energy arbitrage optimization, uh, forecasting, protection, control automation, power system design, um, including real-time load management, grid synchronization, and power import-export. Um, Paul comes to us by way of the UK. Also joining us today is Scott Kessler, um, who was part of the startup of a company called LO3, which you may, you may have heard about. It's a Brooklyn a microgrid startup focused on transactive energy markets for DERs. Um, we're happy to have Paul. Prior to that, he worked for a decade um, in EE at Connecticut Light and Power and, and NY CERTA. Uh, with that, Marcello, I turn it over to you. Uh, so, 
good morning, guys. Within the next 20 minutes, I will present DOP, the solution that we are using to develop smart grid and microgrids around the world. And uh, within the next 20 minutes, I will present this solution with some slides. And um, uh, I want to say that we will go through the introduction of the technology, how the technology is composed, and, and how we are applying this solution around the world. Okay. Uh, following my presentation, I will add the stage to Madalena. Uh, she is all, also from, from Italy, uh, as me, and uh, she will introduce you a project that we are developing uh, in UK for an important university from Newcastle. So, thank you guys. Uh, this is Diop. Uh, we are talking about a digital platform uh, that on the left-hand side you can see the field side that is basically composed by a storage system, a CHP, a multiple loads, whatever you want to integrate basically and connect to Diop that is a cloud solution. So basically we are connecting the local SCADA, the local controllers in order to get the data from the field devices. As soon as we get the data from the field devices, basically, as you can see, uh, we are going from uh, a service that is focusing on the field side and the SCADA system that is the resiliency and control, we are getting the data in order to provide the transparency and awareness of the information that we are getting from the field. As soon as we have the data, basically we are able to interact with the information with algorithm intelligence from the users that can bring into the platform in order to basically promote monetization in order to basically interact with the market and enable, for example, demand response services or optimization algorithm to minimize the cost of the management of the energy that we are integrating from the field. Uh, this in slide, basically you can see that we are, uh, we have in the center of our ecosystem, DIOP, um, that is promoting, as I said, monitoring and optimization service. And so the colors are representing even the use case that DIOP can, can develop. On the bottom of this slide, you can see the controllers that we are able to interact. Uh, some names that you can see here in this slide are um, Siemens product like Zigo, that is a building automation system, we can get the information from the building automation system. Exactly, you can see, for example, the MGC, the microgrid controller, that is an RTU that is able to basically interact as a SCADA system with a, a, a hybrid power plant, for example. A CHP composing a storage system and the PV plants, they can be interacted with an RTU called the MGC that in real time will provide a resiliency service to this kind of ecosystem. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can see that we have uh, other controller as a block. Uh, it means that DIOP with uh, standard communication protocols can interact with any SCADA system that has the specific communication protocol that DIOP is able to communicate. So in this way, the bottom part, the, the field devices, uh, uh, can be interacted with DIOP uh, uh, in a quite flexible way because DIOP has different drivers in order to communicate with the local devices. At the same time, if we see the, uh, uh, the southbound of, uh, sorry, the northbound of this, of this slide, uh, we see other product from Siemens like DEMS that is an interface with the energy market uh, when, for example, DIOP want to calculate the flexibility of the different assets that we have on the, on the southbound and pr promote uh, uh, a trading services on the ancillary service market, uh, create an integration is, with them so could be a solution to promote a demand response service. At the same time, we can see ECAR OC, that is a solution, another cloud solution from Siemens to manage electric vehicle infrastructures. Again, in this way, the interaction with ECROC can be a way to involve the charging units within a smart grid. For example, to modulate an electric vehicle and promote an ancillary service market, an ancillary service from the electric vehicles infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, as you can see other APIs, this means that we have a, a REST API communication that we can involve to interact with the third party cloud-based system. 
and start to create, I want to say, a custom ecosystem to our, to our users to create a different point of communication between one, one system and another one to, uh, to develop a, a flexible solution based on DOP. Uh, I want to uh, just go through the, main, the three main use cases that our solution can, can provide. And as you already understood, we are focusing on a, a cloud-based solution that can uh, connect the, the assets in real time, gathering the information and promote the transparency services. So in this way, we can navigate into our site and in, a, in a multiple sites that we are monitoring and, for example, get uh, a reporting about the consumption, the generation, uh, uh, received uh, uh, alarming in real time when a threshold of consumption or generation is verified, a threshold that the user can create without any problem using our user interface and receive, uh, uh, for example, alarming via, um, via email or via uh, the push, uh, push notification in, in our mobile application. Uh, at the same time, as soon as the transparency value is created, uh, we can go through the optimization one. Behind the meter optimization, this means that uh, we can uh, activate algorithm to optimize our controllable assets to minimize the cost or to respect a specific target even on the CO2 emission. And this will be the use case that Maddalena will present. When we have uh, different resources and we want to manage the different resources not to do uh, cost optimization service, but to promote the CO2 emissions minimization. This can be another target of our optimization algorithm that we can activate, as I said, to basically schedule the controllable assets within the next hours to fulfill the target that the user can basically insert within our platform. Uh, the last use case is the demand response one, the virtual power plant. So we are not only able to uh, minimize cost and uh, minimize the CO2 emissions, but uh, uh, we are also able to um, basically create virtual power plant uh, with a different storage system or CHP, where, uh, wherever, as soon as we have a flexibility available within an asset, DOP can calculate the aggregated flexibility of our virtual power plants and share this information with the TSO and promote an ancillary service to our virtual power plant. And in this case, we can basically use the capacity of our virtual power plant and promote a frequency regulation service. At the same time, we can interact with aggregator platforms to, for example, receive a commands of flexibility and dispatch the commands in an optimal way. Again, here involving our optimization algorithm so for example, we have different uh, flexibility within our multiple sites, and we have also a different cost of each flexibility that the asset owner can share within Diop, okay? And in this way, as soon as the command of flexibility is coming, Diop can decide which is the optimal uh, scheduling and the optimal decision on, of, about which flexibility must be activated in order to minimize the cost of the, of the request flexibility. And in this case, for example, we are maximizing the revenues of the aggregator that is the responsible of the management of the virtual power plant. So again, as you understood uh, within these use cases, we, are, we have different, uh, I wanna call it stakeholders that will log into DOP and will interact with our solution to reach their own specific target based on the on, based on the business that they develop, okay? Uh, this is basically a sort of example of a typical microgrid that we, that we can manage and we are, that we are managing. And uh, basically within this typical uh, representation, we can see on, 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 on this part of our presentation of our slide um, that we have uh, Typically, within our new, I want to say, energy system, we can have a point of common coupling. It means a point of exchange of the electricity within the utility grid. And below our meter, that is the PCC, point of common coupling, we can have a storage system that is basically uh, to, be, to be charged and discharged with, the, the for, for example, the 
photovoltaic power plant that we have here or with the CHP, okay? In order to feed our loads that we can have here, like a building, for example, or charging units. Uh, these systems that is really common to, to see on, 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 our, uh, on our city uh, must be managed in an optimal way because when we have a, a storage system, a PV plant and the CHP, the units must be controlled in order to reach the target that the for example, the district eating, the, sorry, the, dis, the, the, the district operator want to reach in terms of CO2 emission, as I say, or cost minimization. So this is why we are applying DOP as a solution to, to get the data from uh, the SCADA system that we can see here in order to share this information with the user and activate the algorithm in order to schedule, as you can see, the flow of information with the optimal scheduling algorithm, the program to control, uh, like here, a storage system or a CHP in order to reach the target that we have said before. At the same time, on the left-hand part here, we can see our, uh, the, uh, our solution, the ICAR Operation Center, that is a solution focused on the management of the electric vehicle infrastructure so ECROC is mainly focused on contracting, uh, uh, defining a tariff. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a cloud solution that is not related, is not relating with energy, it's relating with uh, the management of the electric vehicle infrastructure. So the typical user of ECROC uh, is basically the EMP, the e-mobility provider, or the CPO, the charging point operator. Those are the typical stakeholders that are using ECROC. At the same time, this solution is integrated with DOP in order to gather the information about measures, measurements of the charging unit consumption. And the charging unit is something that you have to involve within the microgrid management because charging units can involve um, really can provide an issue in terms of peaks that can, must be managed because sometimes you want to install an amount of charging units that are exceeding the maximum value of the uh, fed out power from the grid uh, that you can that, that you can that you can uh, that you can use to feed your charging units so you have a maximum level of consumption that you can have on your charging unit so in this way the charging unit must be modulated to avoid the peaks that you can reach if you don't module the charging units. This is why the charging units are another element that must be uh, considered within DOP in order to control the microgrid in an optimal way, even considering the cost of the electricity or, and or the weather forecast. That is an, a, a really important information to, for example, predict the renewable generation. At the same time, the electricity market is another information that we, you have to interact with to predict the cost for the next hours and let the algorithm to decide the best strategy. Uh, at the same time, the demand response use case is uh, uh, the same microgrid that we have seen before can be a part of a virtual power plant where DOP will again measure the real data in order to aggregate the real data and, and share the real data aggregated to the TSO and the flexibility value the flexibility of a microgrid is something that can be calculated by DOP and or can be defined by the owner of the assets. So the owner of the assets can decide the amount of flexibility that he wanna share to the, to the ancillary service market. So we have these two solutions, but at the same time you can, see, you can understand that even the asset owner is an important uh, stakeholder to be involved within the management of this kind of ecosystem, okay? So as soon as we get this information, we share the, the aggregated value to the TSO and the TSO will send a flexibility requests that can be dispatched in the optimal way as I have already described it before. Just to go through the uh, architecture, um, as I said, this, uh, this uh, solution is a cloud solution. So the user will log within a specific URL, username and password is even a multi-tenant, so more users can log within the same instance with different 
rise and rolls. Uh, at the same time, at the bottom of this slide, you can see the different interfaces that we can have uh, from the SCADA system to a charging units, an inverter, etc., etc. It doesn't matter. The, the reality doesn't matter the, the, the physical units. The important uh, is that the, that physical units has a standard communication interface. In fact, uh, the connectivity module is exactly the module that the user can configure the gateway that is the driver for the communication and the, for the uh, tr uh, translation from the local communication protocol, like for example, the Modbus TCP, IP, TCP IP protocol in the native protocol of DOP, that is the MQTT. So uh, the communication must be, uh, must be a topic because DOP is not designed based on the IoT paradigm. So first of all, we have to understand how we want to get the data. And this is why we have different communication gateways to interact with the field devices and get the information and produce the information in MQTT. At the same time, as soon as we have the information, we can basically activate the different microservices. And in this, in this way, the platform can be composed with the different microservices that we have, create, we have available in order to allow the user to log into, into, the, into, our, into our platform and uh, use it uh, as an operator uh, with different uh, reporting, uh, views, uh, dashboarding uh, that can be customized, of course, uh, in order to really focus the, uh, the service on the, on the user needs. And uh, as you can see here on the right-hand part, uh, the different algorithm to cover optimization use case and or to cover demand response use case can be again here activated to create the service requested by the user. Uh, on, on the right hand side here, we can see that DOP again, as I said, is a cloud solution, uh, can be also deployed in a third party cloud infrastructure uh, to be evaluated, of course, case by case. Uh, our solution uh, by default is proposed uh, within Microsoft Azure in Europe. This is the place where DOP is, is, uh, is located in Amsterdam. Um, at the same time, uh, the integration is another important element because we have standard development kit uh, to allow the user to, for example, um, integrate third party devices. So we have our MQTT specification that we can share to create uh, by yourself your own gateway to produce the information from your own protocol in MQTT. At the same time, we have uh, the development kit to allow the user to interact with REST API and, for example, make a communication, a cloud to cloud communication between your own cloud system to DOP with our API. Um, another important element, and it's something that we want to spend a little bit of time later, is the SDK for the algorithm integration. And this use case is really important with the university. And we are developing different projects around the world about this because we have a standard development kit for in order to allow our user to integrate their own algorithm based on the, on the languages that they want to use. For example, Python, C++, MATLAB, they can develop their own algorithm and share via API again here with a framework called a gRPC, the information and share the data in a bi-directional way, of course, from the op to the algorithm and vice versa. Um, just for the communication, the gateway that we have mentioned before is something that we are installing within what, what it is called the um, nano-personal computer, so our really small computer and, 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 and uh, I want to say that are, uh, are something that you can be uh, in, a, in a really uh, easy way installed uh, within our uh, customer network in order to make this conversation from the local protocol to MQTT. Uh, we have the other solution to, to allow the communication, for example, via VPN, so without any gateway installation, but this is the preferable way install a local IoT gateway 
and within this IoT gateway installed within the customer network, make the, uh, the, the, the conversion from the local communication protocol in MQTT. And it's really important uh, to provide the, this conversion in MQTT within the customer network uh, because MQTT is an encrypted protocol. So you can go in internet without any VPN. So if we install the gateway locally, sharing the data within internet without a VPN is something that it can really support uh, the project development uh, uh, without uh, uh, respecting, first of all, security uh, requirements and at the same time avoid to spend uh, too much time and effort uh, to, for example, uh, uh, install the VPN. Um, as I said before, Diop is a, is a platform that can be really um, customized in terms of communication in the, in the southbound, southbound via MQTT, uh, even, sorry, importing uh, uh, the data in, in CSV or XML via the specific importer that we have uh, via SFTP, we can import this information and or via REST API. Um, at the same time, if we go into the back end, uh, we have different way to interact with the information with uh, a specific uh, uh, rules engine. So the, the user can create a rules engine, for example, with different modes, you can activate the intelligence. So you have developed your own algorithm and you can decide to activate the algorithm on a specific mode and calendars that you can create with Dio. At the same time, the algorithm can be even activated with triggers. So for example, if your consumption is exceeding the threshold that you can configure, and as soon as the threshold is verified, you want to activate a specific algorithm to avoid peaks, this is something that you can do with Dio. Uh, another module that is really important is the formula engine. So with Dio, you can create formulas, uh, and we have a specific UI that you can use to uh, interact with the information and create a sort of script that, that can be even complex uh, to, for example, create an energy model. This is something that we have used with FCA in Maserati here in Italy, where our energy manager from Maserati, uh, he has developed a really sophisticated uh, um, uh, formulas to, for example, predict the energy based on process data. And this is a really important value because in, if you have this kind of model, you can avoid meters installation that most of the time it costs money. So with Diop you can create with the formula engine this kind of, uh, um, um, this kind of uh, modeling. Last but not least, the algorithm engines. As I said before, we have plugin to interact with the algorithm, as I said, with the gRPC framework. And this is the academic package that we want to mention. Again, you have understood that we have uh, uh, the, uh, basically the requirement of an academic is to interact with the data and to, uh, to use the algorithm that, they, that the researchers want to develop. And DIOP can be the interface with uh, the local systems and the, uh, the algorithm that our users, uh, that are the researchers or the students want to develop and activate with our solution. And this is what we have um, designed with our uh, university and what we are doing with them and allow basically in this way the a value chain to let our user to interact with the real data. And the, 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 this is an example of what we are doing in, uh, in our campus in South Africa where we have a microcontroller that is the RTU, the Zico CC that is the building automation system that uh, interact with the students to allow them creating logics, intelligence, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and promote a service uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, unique at the end. Uh, we are basically around the world, uh, and uh, we have different projects uh, from uh, microgrids uh, uh, till uh, demand response services in Italy, but of course, as I said, globally. Um, at the same time, I will let uh, now, um, if you agree, uh, I will let Maddalena introduce uh, the, uh, the project uh, from, from UK. And uh, that we can see here, the project called SAND. And she will 
give you an introduction about what we are doing with the also real demo about uh, the fantastic project in, in UK. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Maddalena Pondini and a um, brief introduction about myself. I'm uh, a project engineer in, uh, in the OP team uh, and in my role I'm, uh, let's say, uh, responsible of following uh, projects uh, directly uh, interfacing with the customer and uh, uh, let's say having a uh, the possibility to uh, understand what are the functionalities requested by the customers and to implement them uh, in the configuration of the platform that has different uh, microservices uh, as Marcello just explained. So uh, today I'm, uh, uh, let's say, uh, presenting to you the um, uh, project uh, that is ongoing uh, with the Kiel University in UK. It's a really big campus in the UK, uh, about 600 acres, and uh, the main objective uh, of this project is to, uh, let's say, demonstrate uh, the possibility to have a huge smart grid play Playing a role in terms of uh, CO2 minimization and in terms of uh, flexibility um, management inside uh, the campus uh, through the controllable assets. So, uh, of course, this enables also a great um, collaboration between uh, researchers uh, and. Uh, as uh, since researchers are uh, utilizers of, of the platform. And as Marcello already uh, highlighted, uh, one of the main purpose is uh, research uh, being, uh, let's say, enabled also uh, by the data, uh, the wide uh, amount of data we are uh, monitoring and um, and uh, let's say uh, visualizing inside the platform. So um, just a couple of uh, numbers about uh, this project. We have uh, a huge campus, as I mentioned, where uh, 25 substations are, uh, let's say, configured. So it's quite a big uh, grid in which uh, there is a main incomer and uh, smaller substations, some of which are controlled uh, by uh, microgrid controllers, so RTUs, uh, let's say, interacting uh, directly at substation level. Uh, there are six uh, uh, rooftop PV plants around the campus, which we are, we are monitoring. Uh, six flexible buildings, uh, which uh, provide flexibility for um, for CO2 minimization and uh, for uh, grid uh, balancing services. And we are also, uh, let's say, gathering data from something around 500 meters around the campus. So these meters uh, are, uh, let's say, acquired and monitored through different platforms and all of them via SFTP uh, service uh, through an interface directly to the op we are collecting all these meter readings uh, uh, into the op these type of meters are um, let's say monitoring energy uh, vectors such as gas meter readings electrical meter readings and heat meter readings of the different buildings so this enables of course uh, the analysis, the multi-vector energy analysis for the buildings, and also an understanding of um, for the flexible buildings, for example, how much they are playing a role in CO2 minimization. We are also uh, monitoring and uh, uh, we will start controlling soon uh, CHP and electric gas boilers uh, in which, uh, let's say, dedicated logics will uh, also implement uh, uh, CO2 minimization according to um, an interface that we have with the uh, GRPC, with the, uh, sorry, um, API uh, carbon intensity provider. So there is a service in UK that we can call through APIs that provides uh, a carbon intensity of the grid in terms of kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour for
forecasted so that we can use that in terms uh, of uh, uh, let's say logics and uh, uh, in order to define uh, how to use flexibility available from the assets to minimize CO2 consumption in uh, the campus. Uh, also, charging stations will be installed uh, in the campus. Uh, some of them are already there, and eCaroC will be uh, the platform uh, that will talk to DIOP and uh, implement uh, uh, modulation commands in order to uh, fulfill uh, demand response uh, signals coming from, uh, from uh, um, let's say, the platforms that are uh, identifying uh, grid constraints inside this huge uh, uh, campus. Um, so about the functionalities, uh, as I already mentioned, demand response is of course um, one of the functionalities uh, that is needed in such a big and complicated network where many substations are controlled and where there are platforms that are also playing a role in identifying constraints in the network and uh, uh, let's say calling flexibility to us in order to uh, balance again uh, demand and uh, supply inside this network. So uh, flexibility management uh, is also another um, functionality in which uh, the, the target is to use the flexibility available uh, from the controllable assets in order to implement CO2 minimization logics. We are already doing that in the flexible buildings in which we have uh, a forecast of flexibility available for the, for the following day. And we are comparing the CO2, so the carbon intensity of the grid in kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour in order to define when uh, this value is overcoming a certain limit to activate flexibility of the building. Of course, uh, functionality is also involved uh, a huge contribution uh, from uh, researchers that implement uh, formulas, analytics, and uh, digital twin capabilities uh, within the platform. Because uh, um, uh, as we will see in the demo, uh, there is the possibility to customize formulas inside the, um, the assets and to elaborate the signals coming from, uh, uh, from uh, fields in order to um, define uh, new parameters, uh, either for uh, analytics or either for uh, digital twin validation. So you can model your asset and uh, you can validate it if you have uh, meters, uh, let's say, enabling this validation. Uh, GRPC interface is another possibility. So this new protocol that allows communication between uh, our system with the external uh, algorithms that, uh, let's say, talk GRPC protocol. So uh, the exchange of data real time in uh, read mode or write mode is uh, let's say, allowed by this type of interface. And we are able to uh, define set points uh, to be sent also uh, to the field devices. Uh, API interface is, of course, uh, something uh, really fundamental in this project since we are, for example, uh, calling APIs. So we have customized a gateway that is implementing API calls to um, carbon intensity uh, providers. And we are also talking uh, uh, to other platforms like DEMS, as Marcello was explaining earlier, or to Spectrum, which is a grid control uh, platform, in order to exchange uh, uh, data about uh, uh, flexibility available for the different assets, about DR requests, so flexibility requested to balance the grid. We all manage this inside DIOP and we uh, design customized logics in order to uh, meet the requests in terms of uh, uh, demand response, for example. So this is a quick overview of how the different uh, 
let's say different um, assets are located inside uh, the campus. So we have uh, six flexible buildings, we have eight microgrid controllers, we have different PV plants uh, and uh, CHP uh, installed uh, in here. And uh, several other uh, assets are to be installed. So uh, a wind and PV plant, uh, as well as a storage system that can enable additional optimization logics inside uh, the platform. So I'll now jump to uh, the actual demo of the system. So this is how it looks, uh, so how DOP looks when you log into the system. Uh, you have uh, a page in which a user can uh, customize the visualization of dashboards. So in, in this case, for example, we are monitoring uh, the different substations. We have uh, a marker showing what are the CO2 savings for the current day, for example. And we can also have a, a dedicated dashboard to the single microgrid controllers monitoring. So as you can see, I've uh, configured a dashboard in which each microgrid controller is showing me the current status of energy uh, imported from the grid, uh, frequency, and all the parameters that the microgrid controller is currently monitoring. Of course, the objective of um, the project, as I mentioned, is a lot about uh, using flexibility uh, to, um, to minimize CO2 impact. So we have also dedicated widgets uh, in the dashboards that can associate energy consumption of a building during a day to uh, CO2 um, savings uh, in, the same, uh, in the same day. And um, down here, we can see that uh, we can also implement algorithms such as uh, consumption forecast that can enable uh, additional uh, optimization uh, functions inside the platform. Um, I would like to show you how we have organized the the navigation inside the platform uh, for this type of um, for this type of uh, system, which is quite huge and uh, which might have several uh, ways of, uh, let's say, um, being uh, displayed uh, in terms of assets and in terms of uh, monitoring. So as you can see, uh, here is a map of the system and in the geographical view, we can navigate in the different areas and uh, jump down in the navigation tree to uh, the buildings we are most interested in. For example, if we take the, the example of the library uh, building, as you can see, we have meters uh, that are showing the electric consumption, meters that are showing the thermal consumption. Uh, so, um, in this type of geographical view, we are going to show the balance of the different energy vectors uh, in terms of, uh, um, say, total consumption inside uh, uh, the system. So right now we are monitoring uh, electric consumption for um, for nodes such as uh, student union, for example. I've configured uh, let's say a visualization so that we can see the balance between the different energy vectors in the system. Uh, one additional uh, uh, feature that I was mentioning is the possibility to use flexible buildings uh, flexibility in order to respond to the requests coming from the other platforms. So as you can see, this is not a simple load having only uh, power consumption uh, parameters and signals, but we have many properties describing this type of flexible load like flexibility available in the system, flexibility requested, and uh, uh, most of all, the CO2 uh, saved uh, accumulated daily. So in order to uh, determine this value, it's possible to elaborate uh, in a formula. Uh, for example, the flexibility request that we determine with our algorithm uh, and to take into account the grid carbon intensity 
of the grid. So uh, these two values are computed in order to determine what's instantly uh, the CO2 value uh, saved inside uh, this building. Uh, when we sum up uh, the contribution of all the different flex have a total CO2 saving of uh, the campus. Um, under the electrical view, for example, we uh, don't stick anymore to the uh, geographical navigation, but we, uh, we decided to support the user in understanding from an electrical perspective what's the uh, actual uh, configuration of the network. So we have the main incomer of the entire campus and we have the different substations, some of which may have uh, two transformers and under each transformer we have the main um, meters that are being fed uh, um, by that substation node in particular. So under each node we will have the configuration of the energy balance in terms of import, export, uh, energy consumption and the PV production. In this way each node will uh, will show in a clear way to the user what's the current status of uh, uh, energy balance uh, at that level. Uh, one last thing about uh, algorithms. Uh, I wanted to show you um, how uh, algorithm play a role uh, inside the platform. So this is like a uh, one instance of an algorithm configured for a, um, a flexible building like the library. In this case, we have this algorithm, which is doing uh, uh, what I was explaining earlier. So it's taking into account the flexibility available forecasted for the following day. And it's evaluating what's the carbon intensity forecasted for, a, for the following day in order to decide when to activate this flexibility. Of course, when it comes to manage a single building, that's an easy task. Uh, what Marcello was explaining is that in the end, each one of these controllable assets will play a role in CO2 minimization. So when we will put together uh, flexible buildings together with the CHP and the uh, boilers that are controllable, together with, uh, uh, for example, the storage system and the charging units, we will have a, a, an overall optimization purpose looking at a, a CO2 minimization objective in order to um, be controlled and forecasted uh, to reach this, this goal. Uh, in this example, I've uh, configured, for example, uh, the orange line is showing what is the flexibility request for a specific building. The green value is showing uh, what was the carbon intensity forecasted for that specific moment. And the purple line is showing how much kilograms of CO2 have been saved uh, in, uh, in that specific moment for uh, thanks to this flexibility activation. Okay, thank you for, uh, for uh, listening and uh, we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, uh, Magdalena. We do have one question, and it is from Satish, mm -hmm. um, who comments that this is a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious whether in your practical projects you are starting to see peak forming rather than peak leveling. Also, could you outline optimization methods that you use, um, algorithms and tools? Okay. Uh, in the cases explained, uh, also introduced by Marcello, and uh, in this case as well, we are using, uh, um, let's say, algorithms implemented in MATLAB and GAMS. So in this type of algorithms, uh, uh, the optimization objective, uh, as we mentioned earlier, 
is uh, either cost minimization or uh, CO2 minimization or to define a reliability of the grid in order not to overcome a maximum limit of uh, import from the grid. So um, in these models, each type of asset has been uh, modeled uh, with its specific constraints and uh, specific technological, let's say, uh, values. And uh, the algorithm, uh, let's say, thinks uh, in a forecasting uh, uh, direction. So takes into account uh, PV forecasting, takes into account uh, uh, energy consumption forecast, and uh, uh, is determining a, an optimal scheduling of the different assets according to a, an optimization objective. Wonderful. Thank you um, for that thorough answer. It looks like that was the main question. Um, and uh, just a reminder to everybody, please type any questions that you do have for the panelists um, in the Q&A box and we will give the remaining amount of time um, to answering those questions. If anyone has them, go ahead and type them in. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. Bill, would you like to, Bill or Selena, would you like to close us out? Um, well, I thank everybody from Siemens for a really great presentation. And as you can see on the slide here, our next webinar will be July 22nd from noon to one uh, mountain time. And it should be quite interesting. Frank Curry is a, a new hire there at Santa Fe Community College. He was hired through EPSCoR funding and he'll be leading a uh, discussion of the new workforce development program at Santa Fe Community College. Um, I do see one last question. Yep, um, just saw it. Cover that and then I'll say adieu right now, but go ahead and cover the other question. All right, we do have one last minute question from Steve, Steven Gomez. Um, what scale is this system optimization for? And is there a minimum or maximum size of grid that this will work on? Uh, just, I can give you a feedback about this question. Uh, there is no specific limit in terms of uh, grid size that we can uh, manage. Uh, um, most of the time the assets that we are managing uh, we are talking uh, around the medium level voltage system so we are not used to integrate high voltage system not because we are not able to do this but because our you know business is more focusing on the medium and low voltage system so in terms of size uh, i don't see a specific limit on our management is only is only a matter of uh, the purpose and the goals that we want to achieve with our with our users okay even in terms of sizing uh, about the, the amount of assets that we can manage again here we don't have any specific limit because the our capability to scale up uh, using our cloud the infrastructure that can be really scaled in terms of amount of let me say um, IT resources resources to be used uh, can be really fulfill uh, the request uh, to scale the amount of uh, assets to manage within our within our platform. Outstanding, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, with that, we would obviously like to thank all of the wonderful panelists who joined us today. And um, we, again, welcome you to join us for the next webinar on July 22nd. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.